It is what's happening today in our Muslim world. And then, inshallah ta'ala, as we discuss a little bit of the concept, with the blessing of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that we have our dearest Dr. Sajidina with us, a brother that I have known him for many years, a brother that I'm proud to be. Of course, he's a student, inshallah ta'ala. And uh, we will benefit from his knowledge. <clears throat> Very briefly, allow me to say that we know that we are not going to go through the history of Zahra Salamullah, which is a long one. We know that on the second year of the Hijrah, uh, if there was no Ali, there was no Kufr for Fatima to Zahra Salamullah. So they got married. And then <clears throat> we know that from uh, the Battle of Khaybar, what was happening, <clears throat> and inshallah ta'ala, we will hear from some of the issues. Khaybar was defeated by Imam Ali. Next to Khaybar was an area which is called Fadak. Both of them were a stronghold of the Jews in Medina. Khaybar, that was no way that anybody could have defeated, and Ali defeated that one and took over by the war. So there was booties, and of course, Ghanaim that was in Khaybar was split between the people that they fought it. However, in Fadak, which was a strong, or the place that all the Jews were there, they noticed that, oh, if Khaybar has been defeated, for sure, if a fight, we will be defeated too. So what did they do? They gave Fadak as a gift to Rasulullah, don't fight us. So it is a property of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And after that one, that Fadak is no longer as the property of Qana'im, of the war booties and all of these things, that it was fought for it. So it was all Rasulullah's. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam has only one, inher one individual that will inherit all of his wealth, and that is Zahra sallallahu alayhi For uh, your information, there was some, of course, some of our brothers that he went, and he took some movies and some pictures from the Khaybar, that we know what it is. Unfortunately, these days, Khaybar has been rebuilt by billions of dollars by the uh, Ali uh, Saud's families. So what was the reason for that? Allahu Alam and inshallah, we will, uh, uh, they will be defeated anyway. So after that one, we will see that Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi is passing away on Hajjatul Bida, he talks. After his words that he was talking, Zahra Sallallahu Alaihi is very upset that I'm losing my father. Loss of the father for the daughter is a lot and especially the only daughter and the father. <clears throat> so based on that one, uh, there was something that Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam whispered on her, her ear that it was happiness of Zahra. Whatever that it was, that sir, probably, probably, I'm not saying that it is written anywhere, it is said between them, that Zahra, don't worry about that. You are the first one that you are going to join me and you are the one that you will be buried with me. <coughs> Therefore, uh, Zahra started to uh, smiling and laughing, becoming happy. Then after that one, we will see that as soon as the Prophet ﷺ passes away, what happens already, all of the idea that was supposed to be taking place according to the way that it was planned, it didn't take place without land or cursing anybody. We just talk about the history. I don't have a key to heaven and hell, and you probably know what happened. All of this event that took place, and then we will notice that Zahra Salamullah is being deprived of that garden, which a lot of people are working in it. Ali alayhi salam is taking care of it. So many people are taking, and, and then the income of that one is actually coming to the hand of the Muslims and the Mu'mineen. And so that was taken away. And for sure, we knew if that had taken place, would Zahra Salamullah be buried in the same area that probably was supposed to be buried? So the question comes, maybe no. Therefore, what happened? 
Sad al Abwab. You probably have heard it on the Daw of Notband, the Khai story that we have. There were a lot of doors that they were opening to the shrine of Rasulullah or, to, or the Masjid al Nabi at that time, of course. All of the door of the Sahaba, they were opening and they were coming from their houses to the Masjid. So the concept of Sad al Abwab became an issue first before Rasulullah passes away. So all the gates, all the doors that it was from the houses of people coming inside the masjid was shut down. Except one door and the Bab of Ali alayhi salam. Now we are reading that in Dua not bad, but of course I'm making it very brief inshallah ta'ala. After it was finished, then we know Zahra salamu alayha is passing away. Historically, many things happened during this time. What happened to Mohsen? The, uh, the, the son of the... Uh, Ali alayhi salam, the baby that was actually not born, and he was uh, what they call it, sect, miscarriage. <coughs> all of these issues is historically written in all the books. Don't, we are not talking about the Shia Sunni issues. It is written everywhere. So after these issues that it took place, Zahra salam alayhi knew that what father told her. Ali alayhi salam makes a decision. Go to the Baghi. Some of the people have to go to the Baghi. Zahra had passed away. Make some loosened area like the grave, three, four places in Baghi. So some of the loved ones by the Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi they go ahead and dig up some of the areas in Baghi. And after they dug up, some few days later, they are asking, or when they are asking, we don't know. How is Zahra? She's very sick. How is she doing? Zahra had passed away. When did she pass away? They don't talk. Where was she buried? They don't talk. Some of the Sahaba says, well, let's go ahead and check Baghi to see where, what part of Baghi is she buried. They go ahead and they notice there are oh, one area, not two area, not three area, and sometimes they say four or five. I don't know how many it was. So there are areas that it is dug. Which one are they? Yo Ali, which one are they? He doesn't answer. They decide, okay, what we will do, we will go ahead and dig each one of them. When we go down and it is rough, that means this is not the area that was dug all the way as a ground, as a grave. So we go to the next one and next one. That is where Ali alayhi salam comes with his sword. He says, in this time, it is my wife and my right. And anybody that wants to go ahead and do that, is involved with my sword. Now, the other uh, uh, idea that I'm expressing is from the khutbah of Nahjul Balagha, khutbah number 202. If we read it, which it says, Inda Dafn al Fatima, Ali alayhi salam is talking about that issues. <coughs> it seems like at night they have to go ahead to the shrine of the grave of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi salam, dig it out. This khutbah is very beautiful. And as soon as, of course, Rasulullah digs down that area, Assalamu alaikum ya Rasulullah. And then he says that any when Ibn Atika Fatima al Zahra Salamullah alayha, that this salam from both of us, and then the one that it is Nazilat fi Jabarik, that it is coming down next to you. And then, of course, the ahadith is that the of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa uh, open up, the, the coffin is open and received the Zahra Salamullah alayha. They wouldn't, if they would have known that this happened, for sure there was no way that they would let Zahra Salamullah alayha that has been already by many of the unfortunate people that they were around the Rasulullah sallallahu whatever they have done, they wouldn't let her to be buried there. This is where one of the ahadith says that she is buried inside the grave of Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam. When Imam Ali is passing and leaving the grave, if you read the khutbah of 202, she, he says, not because I have to leave, that I don't want to be with you, but I leave because I have to leave. As-salamu alaykum Then to both of you, salam, then he leaves. So the idea of Saddul al abwab was that nobody comes to the shrine, to the house of Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam. And then the other part was that Ali alayhi salam does not want us to become confused. Where is the grave of Zahra? But he wants us to think, what happened? Ya Ali, why don't you go ahead and fight? It is your right. Mathalul imam ka mathalul ka'abe. Yu'ti wa la yu'ta. 
the example of Imam is people have to come. I can't go force myself to them. A day is going to come that they choose and they will be all coming together and discuss these issues. So one is the, the uh, issues of the Fadak. That was the issue that, of course, it is in our history and talking about that. The other one is the grave of Zahra Salamullah Alayha, which has to be known. Of course, a hadith from Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is at the day of, of course, the time of Imam Mahdi Ajalallah Ta'ala of Harajur, when he comes, people will know it, will find it. And the more you study about that, the more we know what happened. And this unfortunate part, as you probably know, Imam Hassan, which is the same, the son of Zahra Salamullah Alayha, is supposed to be buried in the same house that he was born. But what happened? He wasn't allowed to. So he was, actually, you probably know that uh, uh, his janazah has been attacked. Historically, we are talking about from both the school of Shias and Sunnis. Therefore, after this happened, we will see that what was the reason that Ali alayhi salam has to go ahead and do that. And Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi salam has to order Saddul Abubab, close down all the gates that it is coming so nobody comes to the shrine of Rasulullah. So it will be buried to that. Allahu alam for the rest of it. According to what of whatever that I have collected, and especially the khutbah of 202, we say, uh, Assalamu alayka, ya Zahra, ya bint Rasulullah, ya hujjat Allah ala khalqa, ya sayyidatna wa saadatna, inna tawajjahna wa sashwana wa tawassalna biki ila Allah, wa qaddamna ke bayna yaday hajatna, ya wajihatan inda Allah, ishfa'i lana inda Allah. At this time, inshallah ta'ala, we ask our dearest brother, Dr. Sachidina, to uh, enlighten us regarding some of the life of this great lady, that without Zahra, there won't be no Risala from beginning to the end. Without Zahra, there won't be no Imam Mahdi coming. Without Zahra, there won't be no justice on earth. Zahra Alayha, is the center of all the beauties that we can talk about. May Allah make us to recognize her rank and be a true follower of that path. Sallu ala Muhammad wa Allah. You know that I'm not doctor. Oh, I'm Abdul Aziz. Yeah. Forgive me. No, I'm Abdul Aziz. Oh, no, brother, forgive me. I know that. Okay. Alhamdulillah, Abdul Aziz. I can't claim to be a physician, can I? Have you seen me in the clinics? Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. <laughs> Rahmatun lil alameen Abil Qasim Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam. Wa ahli bayti al-tayyibin al-tahirin al-ma'asumin wa ashabihi al-muntajabin. Brothers and sisters, salamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. I pick up from the last sentence that our brother Nahidian said, which was quickly ended, that the prophethood of Muhammad وسلم, would have been impossible without Fatima al-Zahra. I'm not exaggerating. I'm a student of history. When I read the history, I do find that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created men and women 
for the guidance of humanity. In the Quran, you never know that it was Adam first or Hawa first. They were together created from the same soul as the Quran teaches. We never created a hierarchy of man over a woman. The Quran did not do that. When the Quran speaks about the creation, it brings a man and a woman together and holds them together as the guide of humanity. Because man cannot guide a woman in all respects, and a woman cannot guide a man in all respects. A woman has her station, and a man has his station. Professor Said Hussein Nasser, when he wrote about, he has a beautiful article about Hadith e Kisa. And Hadith e Kisa is the Hadith in which the significance and the centrality of Fatima Zahra salamu alayha is presented in one statement, Hum Fatima tu wa abuha wa ba'aluha wa banuha. The introduction of the family of the Prophet was not made through Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. It was made through Fatima. Because Jibreel asked, who is under this, you know, blanket, Kesa? And the answer was, it is Fatima. Her father, her husband, and her children. In other words, what we are looking at is what Brother Nahidian in a very short statement said at the end that the Risala of Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam would not have been perfect without the presence of Bibi Fatima Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. But I want to bring demonstration here. I want to bring a proof here. As a student of history, I'm opening any page of history and Brother Nahidian is right that all the sources are speaking about Fatima. There is no a single source from Istiab of Ibn Abdul Barr, from the Uzdul Ghaba, from any book that you open, any book that you open, there is something about Fatima to Zahra there. Because one thing is clear, that we will not appreciate the Risala of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam without understanding Fatima to Zahra. I'm not saying without loving, I'm saying without understanding Fatima. And the reason is very simple. When I opened the period of Jahiliya in the Arab tribal system, then I find, I find that, to my horror, I find a woman is simply a property of the tribe. She does not have a dignity. She is not a person. She doesn't have rights. She is open to abuse, by the world of the tribal, male-dominated society, in which she has no position whatsoever. You want to understand, then you open the Quran and read the Quran carefully. Then you will see how a woman is treated. You open the pages of history. You open the history books and the books of this Hadith. When you open all these books, one thing becomes clear, that there is deep-seated, inherent prejudice against women in the Jahiliya. She has no status, no position, no respect, not even as a mother, not even as a wife, 
and not even as a daughter. I'm stating that in the pre-modern society, the respect was given to the role that was played by a person. In a modern society, it is individualism and the role is not important. I can change my role. I'm a father, I'm a husband, I'm this, I'm that. And according to the status and the role, I go in the society. I'm an accountant, I'm a professor, I'm a teacher, I'm this, I'm that. In the pre-modern society, there was honor. A person was respected for the role he or she played in the society. So we are asking a very difficult question. In the time of the Prophet in the 7th century Arabia, the history is telling us that the role of woman was not recognized properly. The role of men was there because there was an honor for a man. Abna al-Fulan. There was a mention of the sons, but there was no mention of the daughters. Banat were not mentioned. Abna were mentioned. Abnauna li abnaukum. Our sons for your sons. Daughters were not mentioned. A woman was not mentioned in any other way than someone who was there to form certain utilitarian needs of the society. She could be a wife of someone because you need to satisfy your sexual desires. She could be the mother of someone because you need sons, not daughters. Remember this. This is 7th century Arabia. I'm talking about 7th century AD, CE, common era. That time you're talking about no position for a woman whatsoever. When a girl was born, as the Quran reminds us, and the news came that the daughter is born, then a man's face would turn black. Because he always wanted a son. By the way, that prejudice is present even today in the society. When a daughter is born, oh no, 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 another problem. When a son is born, there is a celebration. Even in American society, I've heard this quite often. I have all daughters. So, are they not important? They can, they can be even sometimes even more loving and caring than your sons could be. That's what the daughters are. In all societies, we find it today, in the Middle Eastern societies, daughters are very important. Now they are important, but in the 7th century tribal system, they had no position. Now let's understand one very important hadith, and it was, sent, it was given at a very proper time. I want to cut exact wording, I don't want to mess up, this is a very important hadith. From the mouth of Fatima to Zahra, salam ala alayhi, salawat ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. This is Ibn Shahra Hashub, one of the historians. The Prophet went to the mosque and gave the khutbah on that day. In the khutbah, he asked one thing. Mata takun al mar'a? Mata takun al mar'a? Aqrab ila Allah ta'ala, ila rabbiha. When does a woman become close to God? A very difficult question. And the Prophet وسلم, he said, I'm giving you this, go and think about it. I'll get the answer from you tomorrow. It was like a class. When does a woman achieve the highest spiritual status with God? And the answer was going to come. But the discussion had to be left 
to the men. Men should go now at home and talk to their women. If you had a mother, you ask your mother. If you had a wife, you ask your wife. If you had a daughter, you would ask your daughter. When does, when do you become, when do you feel close to God? Couldn't there be such a question? Yeah, here it is. Everybody is discussing. Amir al-Mu'minin, Ali ibn Abi Talib, also comes home, and usually the practice was that the Prophet would, the, that uh, Bibi Fatima would ask Ali, what did my father say today? Abu Hassan, what did he say? What did he speak about? Imam Ali said, he didn't say anything. What? He didn't say anything. He just presented a question. Mata takunul mara'a when does a woman get closest to her own Lord, to her Creator? What did you say? The Fatima is asking, what did you say? So I don't know, I was supposed to be, I was supposed to be, I was supposed to wait until tomorrow, I'll have to think about it. Then tell my father this tomorrow. A woman reaches the spiritual station at a time when her eyes don't fall on na mahram and the na mahram's eyes don't fall on her. My sisters are listening very carefully. It's not a time to talk like that in this modern world. It's very old fashioned. It's very old-fashioned to say, I will lower my eyes when any man passes by, or I, I will not let any man see me because I'll cover my face. Those days are gone. In today's interactive world, men and women are standing close to each other and working. And I don't mean to say there is anything wrong with that. But you and I are hearing in this country, in the last whole year, what has happened to women's integrity that has been actually assaulted by men? Men in power. We have seen this. That today a woman, even in this culture, even in this civilization that is modern and recognizes the rights and the dignity of a woman, a woman is a victim. When does that happen? What are the limits of interaction between men and women? How are they supposed to, inter to mix in the gatherings? What are the rules about it? Nobody talks about it. There are no such rules today. I'm, I'm sorry to say that. I, and I'm not longing for those rules where women were completely, you know, estranged from men. I'm not talking about that time. I'm simply talking about, is men willing to take the responsibility? To respect a woman at all times. Is a woman taking a responsibility to say that I remain with my integrity all the time. I'm somebody's daughter. I'm somebody's sister. I'm somebody's wife. I'm somebody's so and so. If men and women take the responsibility, then the society will be much safer, don't you think? Today the society is hungry for those moments when a woman who is driving the car doesn't have to lock the doors because God forbid a stupid man would come and maybe open the door and get in her car and punch her or do so many. We hear, we read about these stories every day in the newspaper. When we think, oh, this is, you know, this happens anyways. No, it shouldn't happen. In an ideal society, it shouldn't happen. Fatima to Zahra Salamullah Aleha, in her answer to Amir al muminin is saying very clearly, Tell my father, 
And as a woman, if she wants to reach the highest spiritual station, then her eyes will not fall on anyone but those who are closely related to her. And no stranger's eyes would fall on her. In other words, in both respects, by the way, we are looking at the specification of the limits. I'm not talking about some imaginary situation, and Fatima Duzahra is fully aware of it. Because tomorrow she is going to come to the mosque and fight for her right for the Fadak. She will come to the mosque. Allama Tabarsi has mentioned it quite clearly. Oh, you should read the book by Muhammad Bakr Sadr, Al Fadak. And that book mentions quite clearly that Fatima to Zahra did come to the mosque and confront the rulers of the time. And she said, This Fadak was my father's gift to me because it was Nafl. Nafl is when you go, when you do not fight, and you get something as a bonus. That's nafl. Nafila. You know the word nafila? That's a bonus. Nafl. It was anfal. That means no horses went. No soldiers went. Father was given as an agreement between the prophet and the tribe, the Jewish tribe. It was nafil. And Fatima to Zahra said, this is my, it was given by my father to me. In other words, she fought for her rights in front of everyone. Now, people have so many hadiths about that. How did she go to the mosque? What happened to her? But I'm telling you something quite clearly, and I, I'm telling you very bravely here. If Fatima to Zahra had not come to speak in the mosque, to fight for her rights, then Zainab al-Kubra would not have given lectures in Damascus or anywhere else. It's impossible to imagine that Zainab al-Kubra would come out of the house of Fatima to Zahra and will expose herself to the world in the way we see things happening in the world today. Zainab would not have stepped out because that would have been a disrespect to Fatima to Zahra, salamu alayha. Had Fatima to Zahra not opened that door on that day, she went, to, she went to the Khalifa of the time to say, this was my right. Because the Khalifa was saying that I heard the Prophet selling nahnu ma'ashirun ma'ashir al-anbiya la nurith. We don't inherit we don't give anything inheritance. And be Fatima was strong enough to read the Quran and say, then how about Dawood and Suleiman? When Suleiman was a son of the Dawood and he, was, he inherited his father who was a prophet. What are you talking about? In other words, she had that courage. And she gave a speech and, she, and that speech is recorded in the historical books, by the way. What she said. In other words, if she had not done that, Zainab al-Kubra would not have been able to do that. In Damascus, Kufa, anywhere, she would have been locked up. My mother didn't do it. I won't be able to do it. Not only Zainab al-Kubra, Fatima Kubra, the daughter of Imam Hussein, she gave a speech in Damascus. What we are talking about is, today, we don't even know what date was she born I have checked all the sources and I found out that from the age of her death to 15, 19, 28, 20, 32 you, you go and you just, you just don't know what to believe honestly you don't know when she was born nobody knows when she was married 21st of Muharram, I saw the date. She was married on 21st of Muharram. She was married on 5th of Zul Hijjah. She was married on 17th of Shabbal. She was married in Rabil Awwal. She was married in Rabil Akhar. She was married. What? The Prophet read the khutbah of her marriage in the mosque 
calling Ali, it was done in public. You don't even remember when she was, ma when she was married? Can you imagine? We know that she was nine years old or ten years old when she came, she came to Medina after the Be'asa. Well, some are saying that she was born before the Be'asa, before, you know, five years before the Prophet was made Prophet. In other words, there is variation of dates are mind-boggling. For a historian, it's impossible to believe which source is correct. Then comes the question of her death. When did that happen? 75 days after the Prophet died? 95 days after the Prophet died? When did it happen? Imam Sadiq salam is mentioning. And this is Sadiq Ali Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He is mentioning quite clearly that my grandmother Fatima died 75 days after the 28th of Safar. That is my grandfather's death, Mustafa, Sayyid Muhammad Mustafa. In other words, it was the 14th of Jamaat al Awwal. There are many historians who are saying she passed away on 3rd of Jamaat al Akhar. But I'm asking this very simple question. Is it something about women in general that you don't know their dates? It's true, by the way. Historical sources, when you open them, there is hardly mention of women's when they were born, when they were married, when they were... Women were not important in the tribal society. And that's why the Prophet wasallam, according to all the traditions, whenever Fatima came to the mosque, he stood up in respect for Fatima. Can you imagine the Prophet standing up and saying, Fatima, come and sit next to me. In other words, the Prophet is fighting the system. This is what a reformer does. Reformer comes in a society when the society has devalued a woman as a human being. There is no value for a human being. For a, for a woman as a human being. There is no dignity for her. And the, and the Prophet Wasallam is making sure that my daughter is respected. He is going out of his way. He didn't have to stand up for Fatima. But whenever Fatima came in the presence of the Prophet, he stood up and made her sit next to him, to himself. This shows the respect. In other words, what we are looking at is that the Prophet ﷺ is creating a new paradigm of a Muslim woman. What is a Muslim woman as far as the Prophet's vision is concerned? The Prophet's vision is that this woman is the source of human spirituality. This woman is the source of human morality because she is the mother of your children. She is the wife of your son. And she is the one who is going to lead the future generation with examples. Imam Hassan salam, has a beautiful tradition saying that I always heard my mother making dua, praying. And my mother would pray always for her neighbors. All of them. So one day I asked my mother, Mother, how come you don't pray for yourself? And Fatima says, Ya Bunay, oh my son, when I pray for others, I don't have to pray for me. Allah out of his mercy gives me whatever he wants to give me. But I need to remember everyone in the neighborhood. What a lesson of what we call the self-sacrificing lesson. Now you see all of this in Karbala also, by the way. You see in Karbala, Fatima the Zahra coming to life. Her sacrifice, her sincerity, her love, her care for her children, everything is there. You look at Umm Layla, a Saqafi, the mother of Ali Akbar. She reminds you of Fatima to Zahra, the way she is praying. 
You look, look at Umm Kulthum, the sister of Imam Hussein, and she reminds you of Fatima to Zahra. You look at Sukaina, this small girl that five or six year or four year old, and she reminds you of Fatima to Zahra. What I'm giving you is that there is no way to appreciate Fatima to Zahra except as Aghayna Aini in his books is talking about what we call the spiritual centrality of Fatima to Zahra. She is the one. And therefore, when you pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, then you have to give the wasata. You have to give someone, you know, you, you bring someone as, as a testimony, Ya Allah, in the name of so and so, please be merciful to me. In the name of so and so, please help me out. I'm in deep trouble, Ya Allah, if you can't help me. But for the sake of Fatima, her father, her husband, her children, Ya Allah, listen to my prayers. When you do that, by the way, this is known as Iktishaf. This is Kashf. And this is what we find that Bilal could not give Adhan after the Prophet's death. He would not give the Adhan. One day Fatima to Zahra sent a request. Bilal, I want to hear the Adhan. Bilal said, baby, I am not giving Azan anymore. No, I want to listen to Azan. The whole Alabayt are all gathered together in the house of Fatima. And Bilal is giving the Azan. You know what Bilal's Azan used to do? And I'm talking about spirituality here. There was no competition. Bilal was the prophet's appointed Muavin. One day the Sahaba wanted to play a trick. Don't let Bilal give the Adhan. Let somebody else. He doesn't even know how to pronounce. Bilal could not pronounce Sheen and Sin, by the way. So instead of saying Ashhadu an la ilaha, he used to say Ashhadu an la ilaha illallah. But whenever Bilal gave the Adhan, Jibreel came and knocked the door Muhammad. Muhammad, it's time for prayers. This was the respect of Bilal, by the way. And today Fatima is saying, how to hear the azan of Bilal. Bilal is getting the request from Bibi. And he goes to give the azan today. And uh, all the sources are mentioning, by the way, Abdul, Ibn Abdul Barr, and Mom, all the Shafi, and all others, you know, Ahl Sunnah, Wal Jama, everybody is saying that Bilal gave the azan. In the middle of the azan, People came, said, Bilal, stop. Stop, Bilal. Because Fatima has fallen unconscious. She's no more conscious. She might even die. Bilal, stop. Bilal stopped. And when they came to Fatima, to Zahra, said, Fatima said, let him continue. Let him continue. And she was crying. Because she remembered the days of her father. What I'm telling you today is that Fatima is the source of spiritual wealth of, of Islam. She is the lady of light. She is the lady of light. She is the one who is giving us light. And this gathering tonight is blessing in the name of Fatima to Zahra, salamu alayha. Hum Fatima to abuha wa ba'aluha wa banuha. This is the gathering in which Fatima is bringing the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. She is bringing Ali Amir al Mu'min, she is bringing Al Hassan al Hussein. And little wonder, Iqbal Lahori, you remember what he said? Azik Nisbat Zahra, Azik Nisbat Isa, Maryam Aziz. Iqbal Lahori. Azik Nisbat Maryam, Hazrat Isa. I don't usually remember poems, but this is two or three lines I remember. He said, a senis bat hazrat zahra aziz. Dukhtare un tao, un dukhtare un imam akhiru zaman. 
تاجدار اون بانوی حلعتا این مادر اون پرگار عشق حسن حسین This is the way he is describing This is Iqbal Iqbal used to have a lot of love for Ahlul Bayt One of the things that he did was He wrote them in poems And one of the poems he has given for Fatima to Zahra In which he says quite clearly That Zahra is responsible Maryam is respectable to us because she happens to be the mother of Jesus. But you know, Zahra is respectable to us for three reasons. She is the daughter of the Prophet Muhammad. She is the wife of Ali ibn Abi Talib. And she is the mother of Hassan Hussein, the, the compass of love of God. Ya Allah, accept from us tonight our dua. This is the time for dua. And Fatima to Zahra will listen to this dua. And we'll present our case to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Ya Allah, bihaq Fatima. Ya Allah, bihaq Fatima wa biha wa ba'aliha wa baniha. Ya Allah. Ya Allah. Irhamna wa tub alayna. Inna kanta tawwab al-rahim. Rabbana atina fi dunya hasana. Wa fi al-akhirati hasana waqina awab al-nar. يا الله يا الله ارحمنا وتب علينا إنك أنت التواب الرحيم صل على محمد وعلى محمد السلام عليك يا فاطمة الزهراء يا بنت رسول الله يا حجة الله على خلقه يا سيدنا وساداتنا إنا توجهنا واستشفعنا وتوسلنا بك إلى الله وقدمناك بين يدي حاجاتنا يا وجيحة عند الله اشفعي لنا عند الله يا زهرة even though we are talking about this part of the earth regarding you accept us and make us to be what, inshallah ta'ala, your sons, Imam Mahdi, wants us to be, inshallah. At this time, inshallah, we are asking our brother Qasim to come here and then introduce. And then we have some uh, nohas. And after that, with the permission of uh, brother Abdul Aziz, we will have some question and answers too. Salam ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. If you could please recite Surah Al-Fatiha. Could you keep them on for two minutes? For a few minutes? Can you keep them on for a few minutes? Yes, please. Okay. Would you not be that far? Let's see. Papa, you want me to have a light on now? Yeah, I'll take it. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the Billahi Minash Shaitan Rajim, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in Surah Al-Mulk, chapter 67, verses 8 and 9, states, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, Takadu tamay yazzu min al-ghayd, كلما ألقي فيها فوج سألهم خزنتها ألم يأتيكم نذير قالوا بلى قد جاءنا نذير فكذبنا وقلنا ما نزل الله من شيء إن أنتم إلا في ضلال كبير صدق الله العلي العظيم صلوات الله محمد والمحمد Before I uh, go into the مصيبة uh, just a few words and then إن شاء الله um, we'll get into the tragedy um, my respected and beloved elders, brothers and sisters, assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. I begin in the name of Allah, Azza wa Jal, the most beneficent, the most merciful, Malik al Muluk, the master of all masters, Shahin Shah, the king of kings. All praise and all glory belongs to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, who is the creator of this universe. He has given us this incredible opportunity to exist, and He's taught us and given us the ability to promote that which is good and forbid that which is evil. And out of, what, out of the mercies of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that idea of being able to promote good and forbid evil is quite sublime. For example, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Tabarak alladhi nazzal al-furqan ala abdihi liyakuna lil'alamina nadira. That we've given you, Tabarak alladhi, we've, blessed is he who's given you this messenger, we've revealed to you this message, and we've given you this messenger in order to teach you furqan, to teach you what is right and what is wrong. Right, even in Ramadan du'a we say, bayanat min al-huda wal-furqan, to guide us and teach us what is right and what is wrong. 
And what's incredible is this idea of good. Many a times when people decide whether they want to believe in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala or deny the existence of a creator, this is one of the main reasons. Neil deGrasse Tyson, he's a very famous astrophysicist, and uh, a person asked him one time, you know, do you believe in God? And he said, I don't believe in God. And they asked him, you know, what would make you believe in God? He says, I'm an evidence-based person, so evidence. So they said, okay, what evidence do you need? He said, most people say God is all powerful and all good. And he says, I see evil in the world today, therefore I cannot believe in a Lord. I cannot believe in a creator. Alamat al tabai actually talks about this. And he talks about how many people sometimes will ask the question, we say God is infinitely merciful, but we also say he's infinitely just. So how is it that a creator who's infinitely merciful can also punish? And Allah Tabai he replies and he says to think of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in these compartmental, uh, this compartmentalized sections is wrong, it's incorrect, you shouldn't do this. When we talk about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and we discuss the attributes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that of mercy and that of justice, the attributes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala are intertwined, meaning that they operate together. And that's what's so incredible about the system of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and what's incredible about good and evil. See, when, someone, when evil approaches us oftentimes, we try to justify it to ourselves too. Because blunt evil, just evil when it just presents it to us, is very unappealing. But when evil comes and it's sort of we're trying to justify it to ourselves and it tries to get us to, you know, shaitan comes with the waswas and tries to grab us, it comes and appears as if we're not doing anything wrong. For example, when people gamble often, the first time they gamble, what happens? The first time a person gambles, they start off with funny money, right? We're not playing for money, we're just playing for, for this, we're playing for that, you know, we're just playing to see who's the winner and the loser. Then you start playing amongst your friends and you say, you know, we're still not doing anything wrong. We're, we're just playing, you know, we're playing amongst each other, it's just a few dollars. Then the gambling addiction builds and builds and then now that you've gone down that path, now something that you thought wasn't very harmful, wasn't very evil, now has dra dra uh, taken you down the wrong path. If any of you have read the book, The Power of Habit by Charles Duhigg, he talks about this idea of gambling. And now if you gamble long enough, the idea of even putting money forth becomes an automatic response, meaning you don't even think about it before you put money forward. There's this one lady who talked about, this is why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, do not approach evils like this. This salah is made in order to keep us away from evils like this. There's this one lady who's discussed in this book, and it talks about how she started off, and she would gamble. She would go in the daytime, her family, you know, she was a stay-at-home mom, and she would gamble in the daytime. So, you know, she would start off, and she would win, and she would win. And in the casino, when they have somebody who's, you know, coming in, they, they want to keep bringing them in. So she continues, sometimes she wins, sometimes she loses. She got into a point where she was going every single day. When she started going every single day, what happens is, is that there comes to a point where the casino will start lending you money. So she's, one day she just starts winning and then she starts losing and she starts losing. And the casino is lending her money and she thinks to herself, okay, now if I just win this one time, what's going to happen is, is that whatever I lost, I'll just win back. She goes until she bets away her house. She loses her house. And she doesn't tell her husband until a few months later when, you know, the bills show up that you've, you know, you no longer have your house. And then her parents passed away and she received a certain amount of inheritance. She had tried to stop gambling, but because once gambling becomes this habit, it's very hard to break away from it. See, this one notion that, you know, I'm just going, I'm trying to spend time, you know, it's not that bad, just a few dollars here or there takes you away. She received inheritance from her parents. She's paid off her debts. They finally got a new house. Again, the casinos come calling. Again, she starts going. She starts going. She starts, yes, again, she goes on a losing streak and she ends up losing her inheritance again. The psychological response to her brain had become triggered in such a way that she would automatically, whether she would win or lose, just that thrill of putting her money on the line was incredible to her. That's why in Ahkam uh, al-Khamsa, it said what? It's um, halal, uh, wajib, halal, mubah, makroon, haram. It said if you stay away from haram, the other four will come. Because our soul is constructed in such a way that when we stay away from evil, the only way we have is to go, to go is up. 
That's why when we look at how prevalent good is in our society, how important it is, how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent 124,000 prophets and our Imam uh, Aima and the Holy Lady of Fa Light Fatima al Zahra, salamu alayhi alayha, what do we see? That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying, I'm sending these to you as a light. I'm sending them to you as a guide. Hence in Surah Al-Mulk, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Takado alam ya'tikum nadhir, did a warner not come to you? When they're being flung into the flames, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the angels will ask, did a warner not come to you? Alam ya'tikum nadhir? But they'll reply what? Qalu bala qad ja'ana nadhir, fakadhabna wa qulna ma nazzal Allahu min shay, in antum illa fi dolalin kabir. No, they came, the warner came, we called them a liar, and we told them whatever they were revealing to us was incorrect. Verily, we were in manifest error. When we see the Lady of Light, brothers and sisters, and this is from my own personal tadabbur and my own personal perspective, when we look at, say, the Fatima, my personal perspective and why I look for her for guidance is because she did good for the sake of good. Imam Amir al muminin says it so beautifully. He says, to, he says, Ya Allah, I don't worship you for heaven because that's the worship of a businessman. Ya Allah, I don't worship you for, so I don't go to hell. That's the worship of a slave. Ya Allah, I worship you because you are worthy of being worshipped. That's the difference. Say the Fatima, one time a man comes to her, a woman comes to her, a lady comes to her, and she says, you know, my mother is very ill, can I ask you questions? She said, sure. So she asks, and she asks, and she asks. Say the Fatima replies, and she gives her her time. Again, the lady comes another night. Again, the lady, when she comes, she asks, and she asks, say the Fatima replies. The lady says, oh, lady of light, I've taken so much of your time. You know, I, I've probably become a burden to you. Say the Fatima replies, she says, what's guaranteed to me is satisfaction of my Lord. What's guaranteed to me is a reward uh, that goes from, that reach, that's much more than what's between here and what's in the heavens. So whatever questions you have, I'll answer. One day a poor man came to the Prophet, and he came to the Prophet after Salatul Asr, Jabir bin Abdullah al-Ansari narrates, and he says that this man came to us after Asr. And after he came to us, he said to the Holy Prophet, he said, Ya Rasulullah, I'm poor. My clothes are completely torn. And, you know, I, I, I just need your help. I, I need some wealth. I need something. The Holy Prophet said, I personally don't have anything to give you. But go to this one house where she loves her Prophet. She loves Allah. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and her Prophet love her. So the Holy Prophet says, go to the house of Fatima, my daughter, Fatima bint Muhammad. The man goes. When he opens, the, when he knocks on the door, say the Fatima answers. He says, O oh lady, your father, Muhammad, has asked me, my Prophet has asked me to come to you and to ask you for wealth. Say if Fatima gives him a, a certain piece of cloth. Then he says, you know, lady, O oh lady, this won't be enough. Say the Fatima took a necklace that was given to her from Fatima, Ibn uh, bint Hamza, bint Abdul Muttalib, Hamza the uncle of the Prophet. Something very, very valuable to her. Pearl necklace, and she gave it to him. The man goes to the Holy Prophet, he says, your daughter has given me this and it'll be enough. Ahmad ibn Yasir asked the man, you know, what do you want to do with this? The man says, you know, I'm going to sell it for food and I'm going to sell it for clothes so I can pray. So Ahmad ibn Yasir says, asked the Prophet, he says, Ya Rasulullah, can I buy this necklace? The Holy Prophet says, yes. Ahmad ibn Yasir purchases, purchases it from him. So he gives him 200, uh, he gives him 20 dinar, gives him 200 dirham, he gives him a horse, gives him something that he can eat and drink and to return back to his family. Ahmad ibn Yasir takes that necklace. The man was very happy. He said, Ya Rasulullah, you've given me so much. Say, uh, Ahmad ibn Yasir takes that necklace and he says, Ya Rasulullah, I give this to you along with the service of Saham, one of his assistants. The Holy Prophet says, Saham, he says, can you please go to Fatima? I give you to her in service and for you to give the necklace to her. Saham goes, knocks on the door of the Lady of Light, Fatima al Zahra. And when he knocks on the door of the house, say the Fatima answers. Saham says, 
that I have been granted you uh, in your service and I've granted to give I've been told to give you this necklace. Sayyidah Fatima takes the necklace and she says, Oh Saham, you're free to go. Saham starts laughing. And she asks him, Oh man, why is it that you laugh? And he replies, Because of this one good act, imagine how much wealth was born from it. That an old man who needed food and who was hungry and needed clothes, he was clothed and he was fed. How a person who was in service has now been set free. And at the end of the day, the day, the necklace came back to you. One time, the Holy Prophet, during the time of Quraysh, the Holy Prophet was doing sujood next to the Kaaba. When he was doing sujood, what happens is, is that a person comes and takes the innards of an animal and pours it while the Holy Prophet is in sujood onto the head of the Holy Prophet. The Holy Prophet stands up. This is after Sayyidah Khadija had died, the mother of Sayyidah Fatima had died. So she goes to the Prophet and she starts cleaning him. And she says, now that our mother is gone, I will help you, my father. It's very hard. You know, when we request things from our parents or we request things from people, you know, who may not have it, instead of, ha instead of being happy, you know, when our parents give us something or parents don't give us exactly what we want, it's very difficult for us to say, you know, I'll support you whether you're going through good or bad. Say the Fatima, whatever struggle her father went through would support him. And what's incredible is that the sacrifice of Fatima didn't, didn't stop even after she had passed away. When we see Ali al-Akbar on, on the ride to Karbala, we'll see Sayyidah Fatima. We'll see it in him. Ali al-Akbar, on the way to Karbala, when they were going to Karbala, he sees his father, and his father had just woken up. He had, he had a certain vision. When his father had this vision, his father, Abu Abdullah al-Hussein, Abu Abdullah al-Hussein, you know, all of a sudden says to him, he all of a sudden says, Inna lillah wa inna ilayhi raji'un. He says, from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we have come, and to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we shall return. Ali al-Akbar asks, and he says, my father, you've just said this, why is it that you've said this? Abu, uh, Abu Abdullah al-Hussein replies to his, to his son, he says to him, my son, my grandfather has come to me, and he said, Soon I will return back to him. We will return back to him. Ali al-Akbar replies and he looks at his dad and he says, My father, are we not on haq? Are we on truth? Abu Abdullah al-Hussein replies, Bila shaq, without doubt. Ali al-Akbar looks at his father and he says, Our father, if we are on haq, then let us continue. Let us go and continue to raise the banner and die in the way of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Can you imagine the state of Abu Abdullah al Hussein when he's looking at his son Ali al Akbar on that 10th of Muharram? And he has a son like this that will give his life for his father. Ali al Akbar, it said on that day, Ali al Akbar was a spitting image of the Prophet. That Ali al Akbar, when he did the Adhan on the 10th of Muharram, the companions of the Holy Prophet would cry and say, it's like we're seeing the Holy Prophet recite the Adhan. That Ali al-Akbar, brothers and sisters, on the 10th of Muharram, he went, he was amongst one of the first of Banu Hashim to go and, to go and die in the way of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the 10th of Muharram. When he goes to his father, he says, my father, give me permission to go and fight. Abu Abdul al Hussein looks at his son and he says, my son, he says, go. How can a man, can you imagine the heart of Abu Abdullah al Hussein on that day? That 10th of Muharram, an 18 year old son, he has to tell him, go fight in the way of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Ali al Akbar would try to leave the tent. He would go and try to bid farewell to say the Zainab. He would leave. He would try to leave the tent. The women would pull him back in. He would try to leave. The women would pull, back, pull him back in. Ali al-Akbar goes. Finally, Abu Abdullah al Hussein takes Ali al-Akbar. And he says, my son Ali, go. Ali al-Akbar. When he gets on the horse, he starts riding. And this, he hears steps behind him. And he, when he hears steps behind him, he turns around. He sees his father, his old father, who's had so much loss on his day. He sees his old father walking behind him. Ali al-Akbar says, my father, we've already bid farewell. Why is it that you follow after me? 
Abu Abdul Al Hussein replies, he says, Oh, Ali Al Akbar, if only you had a son, you would know the pain that your father's feeling at this moment. Ali Al Akbar goes towards the battlefield and he's fighting very, very valiantly. He introduces himself, Ana Ali ibn Hussein ibn Ali, and the people, and he's fighting. And when he's fighting, the people, the other army starts to cry and they start to look towards Ali Al Akbar. The other army said it was as if the Prophet was coming towards us, as if the Prophet was fighting us on that day. It said that Ali al-Akbar on that day killed around a hundred soldiers. Ali al-Akbar as he's fighting, he looks back towards his father. He looks back towards his father and he says, let me go and bid farewell to my father one more time. Ali al-Akbar goes, bids his father farewell one more time. He goes back towards the battlefield. This time a man by the name of Marra saw that Ali al-Akbar had turned for a moment. Marra takes a spear and he puts it through the chest of Ali al-Akbar. Ali al-Akbar falls to the ground with this spear and he calls out to his father. Abu Abdul al Hussein, seeing his son on the floor of Karbala, he goes, rides towards Ali al-Akbar. As he rides, he sees Ali al-Akbar and he sees him covering his chest. He sees that the spear has gone through the chest of Ali al-Akbar. He sees Ali al-Akbar now and he sees him crying. He sees him laughing, he sees him smiling and then he sees him crying. He says to him, my son Ali al-Akbar, why is it that I see you smile and why do, is it that I see you cry. He says to him, my son Ali al-Akbar, my, my father Abu Abdul al Hussein. I smile because I see Rasulullah. I see him bringing me a cup of water. My son, why do you cry? He says to him, my father, I cry because I see my grandmother, Lady Fatima. She is yelling, wa walada wa Husayna. Inna lillah wa inna ilayhi raji'oon wa say'alamu alladhina dhalamu ala muhammadin ayya man qalabin yanqalibun We pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to help us, protect us, guide us, keep us happy and healthy and away from all evils and calamities as individuals, as a family, as a community, and as a nation. Wa akhiru da'wa inna alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen. Awesome. May Allah protect you and bless you, alhamdulillah, for such a blessing that we have. Inshallah, uh, with our permission of our dear brother, Brother Abdul Aziz. Yes. Okay. Yes. No day. No day. <coughs> so we have a question, inshallah. Yes, you, have, yes. you have something to say? Hold on, let's get the, get the Salaam, microphone. Alaikum. Sorry, the I'm just going to bring the microphone because if you, if you don't speak into the microphone, then it won't be on the, on the, on the video, and then people on YouTube will not be able to benefit yeah, from the question and the answer. question, please question yourself with the microphone. Um, we learned that uh, the role of the woman uh, should be in the spiritual. So this is true. Today, we see the woman is wife, is mother, and what is really missing, the lots of doubt. How, the, what the doubt? The line of the spirituality that you mentioned. And the spirituality is not just a worship and put hijab, it's, it's, it's not enough. The, just a practical example, back to the, what uh, Hazrat Fatima alayhi wasalam, said, if you want to have the highest spirituality is, your eyes should not follow on no mahram, and the no mahram should not look at you. So in what kind of position I should be in today's society, that I should not mix like that, and I should be away from that line. So what we really missing, a lots of doubt, practical doubt, how a woman should be as a mother, a father, Many fathers work to the extent to be do haram thing because the wife telling them, look at that, uh, we don't have wife. I mean house, second house, one house, bigger house. And woman goes to the work because they want to have a bigger house or they want to bring more income. This is today. I see, I'm working 20 years in Washington, I see that. So how this is what missing, the woman should be a spiritual, said to the man, we, that's enough. This is enough, we should not go more than that. This is missing. So we, we like to, you as a little bit elaborated how we, uh, 
uh, how we do the sp practical spirituality for today? Sorry, I took yeah, too much it, on <coughs> yeah, introduction. It, it is an important question, and I think that uh, it's very important to spend some time <coughs> because the statement of Fatima to Zahra, I was not able to read direct, but now I'm reading it directly. She says, قالت فاطمة سلام الله عليها خير لهن أن لا يرين الرجال لا يرين الرجال ولا يرونهن. In other words, what Fatima to Zahra is speaking about is the development of inner ability of creating a sense of responsibility. Because I, as a man, can look at another man also quite sinfully. I could do that. And I could do, it's not only woman, it could be man, it could be anything. In other words, I need to develop inner wealth, inner ability to be able to withstand temptations that are plentiful in the society. You and I are moving in a society where the standards of morality and modesty are very different. I don't mean to say that people around me are immodest. People around me are immoral. What I'm saying is that I need to develop within me an ability to remain strict with myself as I go in the society, not to fall uh, in temptations and do things that are improper. This applies also to my spouse. It applies to my daughters. It applies to my sons. What we are talking about is the development of taqwa. Because taqwa in the Quran is a moral, spiritual consciousness. Before Iman can enter, I will be very honest about it. Because the Quran does say quite clearly that this, you know, Balikal Kitabu La Reba Fi Hudan Lil Muttaqin. Alladina Yuminuna Bil Ghaib. It is for those people who have developed keen sense of keen awareness of spiritual and moral responsibility. And then they bring Iman into themselves. Iman is a later stage rather than the beginning. What we see sometimes that, okay, I might adopt, I must tell, I might tell my, my daughter to adopt hijab, but I have not taught her spiritual and moral ability to withstand firmly and, you know, against all the currents that are trying to push her in very different directions than I want to see her. What I want to create is not a false authoritarian fatherhood that is dictatorship. I want to create an atmosphere whereby she, because of my influence on her, is able to develop her own tools. It is a toolkit, which is taqwa, which is helping her to make a decision. There are times when you are making a decision in the society, where do I do? Where, 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 I do, where do I draw a line between this and that? And I think we are not doing enough work in our school systems, in our Sunday schools. We are telling our children, our daughters, to wear hijab, but we haven't told her that the inner strength is more important, that you need to develop a personality. You need to have jihad bin nafs so that you can become firm and strong and stand in front of this world where you have to move. You have to earn, you have to work, you have to do so many things. And if you don't know how to, you know, handle yourself, nothing from religion will help you. So outward religion is different than inward religion. And you and I are struggling with it. I struggle constantly with nafs ammara myself. At this age, old age, I'm 75. And every day you fight. Every day you are confronted with a scenario whereby you can easily lose your path. You can easily become misguided. What B. Fatima is telling us that 
my followers, you will need to develop inner strength more than the outward strength. Because jihad bin nafs will be the only jihad that will help you to carry your work in this world. Otherwise, this world is full of challenges. And I do submit very humbly, very humbly I submit, that it's easy to talk about spiritual and moral values than to carry them in your own life. Because I know, I was teaching in West Virginia in summer classes, by the way. It was a month of Ramadan. Half of my class were women, half naked. Because in summer, they just let themselves go. And here you are, a teacher who is teaching Islam. And these are the, this is, you are fasting yourself. So you are constantly fighting your own nafs. And you are teaching. And it's gradually the power comes to you that it doesn't matter what they are wearing. What matters is how you look at them as your children. So you train yourself to look at them as your daughters, as your sons. And the, and the boys are far more covered, even in summer, by the way, than the girls are. You know, it's just the opposite. And here you are, you're coming. I was coming from Iran at that time. I remember, you know, in 1976, when I started teaching in West Virginia, I, I had to train myself, retrain myself. In other words, I do realize the reality of the situation. I'm not going to create an idealism which cannot be dealt with. What I want to us to remember is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given us the ability. If you do work like Fatima Tazara saying, I don't want to see men like that. It's not that she never saw anybody. She was walking, she was with the in the battle, she was with the Prophet, she was there in Ohad taking care of the, you know, people who had, who had fallen. In other words, she was not at home tied up, you know, in strict hijab and saying that, no, I'm not going to move because I'll be sinning. No, she knew that she was needed outside. Like Zainab al-Kubra, she knew that she was needed. If Zainab was not there in Karbala, you and I would have never heard Karbala would have never known Karbala the way it should be known. Like I'm saying, very openly I'm saying, I will tell any Muslim, by the way, if Fatima was not there, we would not have known what a Muslim woman is all about. When I go in the Sunni world, even on the days of Friday, when they give the khutbah, whenever they cite the example, they cite the example of Fatima to Zahra, not Umm al-Mu'minin Aisha radiallahu anha. No, they don't. But Fatima is there. In other words, Fatima has become the model of that inner strength that no other woman really stands to compete with her. She is Sayyid al Nisail Alamin. Sayyid Bukhari has only three hadiths about, uh, about Fatima to Zahra. One of them is that she is Sayyid al Nisail Alamin. The Prophet says, Fatima is Sayyid al Nisail Alamin. You know when he said it? When the answer came from Ali ibn Abi Talib, that the Prophet asked him, well, who told you this answer? The answer that I read, he said, I heard it from your daughter. At that time, the Prophet said, Naam, hakada, innaha saydatin nisa al alamin. That's how it came. In other words, there was no, you know, fazilat. There was no making up stories. Like we hear all the time, our Zakirin, they make up stories. There has to be some logic in what the stories are about. Fatima to Zahra was the daughter of the Prophet who said, Fatima to Bid'atum Minni. She is part of me. She is part of my Risala. My Risalat. If she was not like that, the Prophet would not have said those things. The Prophet did not say, oh, my dear darling daughter, you know. No, there was no such thing. When Allah said, now recognize your daughter. She is the one who is teaching us, all of us, you know, men and women both. Because she's not talking about women only. She's talking about men. Men should lower their gaze. The hijab is first for men in the Quran, then for a woman in the Quran. 
Men should be more modest, should look down on earth. No, the, the, the men, you know, in Muslim world, men are always looking at women. Like here, they do. The Quran says, no. They should lower their gaze first. Men should behave themselves properly before they ask women to behave. We don't talk about men. We always talk about women. You know, in other words, we really have a good mathalul a'ala in, in Fatima to Zahra. You know, she's no doubt she's going to save us on the day of. Because Muhammad Baqir, Muhammad Baqir said, you know why my grandmother was named Fatima? Because Allah will save her lovers, her followers on the day of judgment because of her. Inshallah, we will be, you know. Before you go to the next question, you have the microphone. In fact, with your permission, when Umar Maktoum, it says, came to the house of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa and Fatima to Zahra was over there, Fatima leaves the room. Rasulullah says, my daughter, Oh, my tomb is blind. He doesn't see you. He says, but Father, I can see him. So this is how much they learn rather than forcing, inshallah ta'ala. Akhi Abbas, with your permission, he's got the microphone, then it's you. Father Akhi. Um, just a couple, a couple of questions, actually. This is probably oh, more, sorry. Sorry. Um, more of an uh, indication of my ignorance, and I hope this is not a transgression, but it's, um, it's a question nonetheless. Um, Regarding Fadak. Regarding? Fadak. Okay, Fadak, yes. Fadak. So, in modern day, if I'm the president, let's say, of the United States, and a diplomat comes or another dignitary comes, and they offer me something as a gift, under mo all the time, they must take that gift and they put it into, like, storage. Because they say, you know what, it's, a, it's, a, it's a, you know, it's improper for a dignitary or the head of a nation to, to accept gifts from other countries, uh, diplomats or dignitaries. And this is, we want to make it so that it appears that there is no benefit other than the benefit to the country from the services that the leader gives. Okay, so if I'm a, just from a layman's perspective, how is then Nafal in this case different than the, in the case of Fadak. I hope that makes sense. I, yes. And then uh, the second question I have, yes. and again, I hope this is not a transgression, but as you had mentioned, when the Kufar came and they wanted to actually try to dig up the, the grave of Bibi Fatima after she had been buried, then Mullah Ali took out his sword. And he said, okay, enough's enough. And the Zulfiqar came out. Yeah. Right? So why did it come out at that time and it was still, and it did not come out when they actually came to his door at, at that point, when they came to, you know, burn the door. So, first, first part is the Fadak. Why didn't Ali defend Zahra Salamullah or defend his household when they came to burn the house? Because he was willing to take the sword out, at, you know, when they, when they wanted to uh, try to... Right, uh, okay, desecrate yeah, her uh, yeah, grave. Uh, so those are, that's a two-part question. Two part. Again, I hope it doesn't go into transgression. It's just thoughts that came up during the lecture. These questions have been always asked, inshallah. Yeah, but w w w the f I, I've forgotten the first question now, you see. The first one was <laughs> that when they said, where is Fatima buried? The first they, question they, was, yeah, they said if I'm a dignitary and I'm given a gift as, let's say, President Rizvi, I become the President of the United States, and dignitaries come, they give me gifts, I put it in storage, they don't belong to me. Even after I leave my presidency, those gifts are put part of the yeah. Smithsonian or something else. I am not allowed to accept those gifts due to the position that I have in public office, right? Similarly, as Fadak was given as a gift, how does that differ from the example of me being a president of a country, receiving a gift, and being a gift of Fadak, same. Does it not? So that's the argument that somebody else, and I don't have the knowledge to be able to correctly answer them and give a very simple analogy or a simple okay. response to it. L let me give you an analogy here of, you know, a state official uh, who is going to make sure 
that claims or entitlements are demonstrated very carefully. The rule in the tribal system in the warfare wars, whenever ghanima, whenever spoils of war were taken, they were distributed, four-fifths were distributed among the soldiery, one-fifth was taken by the prophet. Khaybar was a war, but Fadak was not a war, it was what we call a peace treaty agreement. That, okay, you don't attack us, we give you this garden. In other words, there were no war fought. So the rules of war did not apply. Rather, it was nafal. It was a bonus given to the prophet as part of the leadership. There was no state in the sense of state that you and I know today. The prophet was the state, the prophet was the government, the prophet was the prophet. And they negotiated with him that, all right, we give this and you don't attack us. Because they already heard what happened in Khaybar. Because it was almost impossible to break that, you know, fort. So, it came as a nafal, that means it came, anfal is a different category in which they say, la darab al-ard alayha. Means you did not move your horses for it. You did not go to fight for it. And therefore it was the Prophet's own property and he did not have to divide it among the soldiers or among anybody. It was exactly his. And he could give it to Fatima. Said, okay, I'm giving it to you. That was fully understood that in the time of Umar ibn Abdul Aziz, the garden was returned to Imam Jafar Sadiq by the Caliph that this belonged to you, it was taken wrongly from you. Had it not been that situation from the very beginning, it would not have been returned. So we know for sure the legal aspect of the property was very different. It was nafal. It was not ghanimat. It was not the war that had brought that because then it would have been distributed differently. You had so many other things. Khaybar was distributed. The garden was distributed, you know, the plantation was there, it was distributed because it was part of the war. Well, as Fadak was not. And Fatima's claim was based on the Prophet's own gift. He had gifted this to her own surviving daughter. This has such an impact, by the way, that today in the Shia law, keep this in mind, if this had not occurred, a daughter would not have inherited her father's full estate, you know, at any time. She was the surviving daughter. And therefore, and the Prophet had no sons. In other words, in, other words, in, in the Shia Jafari law, a girl, a daughter, can become the heir apparent of the entire estate because of the paradigm of Fadak that was left in the history. I hope I've answered the question. If that's, if that's what you had in mind. But there was no state, there was no government, there was no... But also let me point it out to you that Imam Ali told his companions to dig 200 graves when Fatima was buried. 200. I have a historical record here. So that they would not find Fatima at all. Because if they had they would have insisted to open the grave and bring her out to do their Salat al janaza Although they didn't care. But for political reasons, they could have done it. And therefore, Imam Ali knew that you make 200, you know, just dig all the you know, land in Baqi. Don't live for them to speculate where it is. We don't know whether she was buried there or not. But they expected there. But she was actually buried between mem member and the Prophet's own grave. This is known as Rauda, the garden. That's where she is buried, not in Baqi. Now, I don't know, we, when we go for Ziyarat, we read, you know, Ziyarat in three places. We read in Baqi, we read in the Haram, we read also, you know, in other places. So in other words, we do it everywhere, but that's what the historical sources are telling us. Now, your second question was, Why did? No, yeah. Yes, yes. That's right. But it never came out when they actually approached his door to get the bayah from Hazrat Ali. So 
why then and not the other time? Like when you, you the defense of his household, you said, you know what? Mm. I'm not going to pull out my sword because it's not the right time. That's For right. For whatever reason, I don't know. But why then was it then he was willing to take out the sword? Honestly, I can't vouch on Imam Ali's mind at that time. And anything that I would say is speculative. And my, my only problem is that Imam Ali knew very well that he would not draw his sword for his personal reasons. Otherwise, history would have written that he drew the sword for his own benefit for his own and therefore he went in the wasiyat of Imam Hassan salam, he was told Imam Hussein was told by Imam Hassan no swords no fighting by no maya to get me a burial place near my mother or my grandfather no don't do that if in other words there were times when the sword was not to be drawn now I don't know I cannot vouch whether this was the reason for Imam Ali but certainly there were many times that he would not, he was not willing to fight. He said, no, I will not do it. Because if I do it, then the history will write, you know, they fought for a burial place. Or, you know, they fought for this and that. And Imam Ali did not want his name to be mixed up in any kind of intentions which were totally incorrect as far as politics of the time go. It was a lot of politics was going on. It had Imam Ali known that there were no politics, it was simply a misunderstanding, he would have thought. But he knew the politics, and he knew what the tribal system could do, and how it could distort. They distorted Imam Hassan's intentions. And we know what they wrote about Imam Hassan in the books. And here was Imam Ali, you know, his personality remained untainted. They did criticize Imam Ali for being very weak in politics. Yes, and he said quite clearly, I will not stoop to the level of Muawiyah at all. I will not do that. So that was Imam Ali's principles. And I really, I'm speculating. As a student of history, many times he said, in all probability, this is what he was thinking about. I don't know. I haven't heard a statement from him about it. Yes. Assalamu alaikum. Alaikum yes. salam. I have a question about the hadith that you uh, recited, the hadith. Uh, from Janabi Fatima to Zahra, salam Is there a distinction in Arabic language between Nazar and Ruyat? Because she uses the term, you know, Ra'a in, in, her, in her description of... Uh, I can't hear very I'm, I'm sorry. I'm asked, the question I have is, is there a distinction in Arabic between the two terms, Nazar and Ruyat? Because the Hadith that you recited uses the second term, not the first one. But when we translate it in English, both are translated. Yes, there, there are variations in that hadith. Some hadiths do use nabr. Okay. Some do. But what I, there are five different hadiths here s talking about the same situation, same issue, same event. And they're using different terms. I chose only one. Not that I, I see it as a probability, but I... I s Whatever I say, I don't know how to read Fatima to Zahra Salam Alaiha. Her intention is far more spiritual than I can ever be able to really interpret it. My only humble understanding is that she wanted to have a moral standard that would defy anything that corrupts human behavior. It's the eyes with which everything starts. Therefore, the eyes is mentioned. Why wouldn't she mention something else? It could be touching. could be something else. But the eyes are the first ones to become the victim. And therefore, she wanted to protect that. She said, I wouldn't let my eyes wander. In Farsi, they say, Chesh, Chashm Charani. You look at all, you know, girls, women, you know, and, you know, in colleges, this is very normal, you know, in Iran or anywhere else in the Arab world. In other words, you have this problem in the University of Kufa, where I taught in Najaf. The boys and the girls, you know, there is always this is going on all the time. Yaraha, Nabaraha, you know, whatever you want to say, Yanduru, it is there. In other words, what Fatima to Zahra, salam alayha, wants, wants us to realize is that Look, it starts from the eyes. If you can train your eyes, 
train them, purify them. And on the day of judgment, you will be saved. Even if you have to face it. Like, you know, I still remember standing in that classroom in the month of Ramadan, in the hot summer, you know, and saying, my God, what a, what a, temp, what a you know, test that I'm going through. And within two, three days, I trained my eyes. I said, okay, this is the situation I'm given. I, I have to teach the course anyways. I, I can't tell them, you know, not to come like that, you know. In other words, you learn. You learn to discipline. Self-discipline is what taqwa requires. I thought my sisters would have a lot of questions. Salam, salam. salam. Yeah, tell uh, me. Uh, is there any ayah in Quran that mentions about hair coverage for women? And if there is, I want to know uh, why uh, hair coverage is uh, wajib for women. And there is uh, like so many confusion among women, especially in today's world, about hijab. And you That's know, right. just wanted. Carry there is. There is. In fact, Surah Al-Nur and Surah Al-Ahzab, they have ayat that speak about covering of the head. Khumur was a char gushe, a scarf. Arab women used to have longer scarves, and it used to cover their chest. That's the description I've seen in the history, by the way. When the ayah, when the ayah came talk about Khomor, that's what they were, they were talking about. In other words, there was something required of a woman when she went, also Jalabiya. Jalabiya is a long cloth whereby the shape of your body is not visible. So two things are together in the Quran. Now there's also the eye, the hijab of the eyes. Absaruhunna, you know, and absarihim. And those eyes, wahzuz, is to lower your gaze. Payin nigah kardan. Instead of looking, you know, at people, you look down. You show your, your modesty, you know, by looking down. So the Quran is quite clear that the problem is, fi qulubihim maradun. Men are sick, according to the Quran. Men have gazes that are not good for women. Women need to protect themselves. Now, first the men are told, you better behave yourself. Don't look here and there. Don't do this. Don't do that. But also the women are being told for something more. Men, they were thawb. They were, you know, long clothes. But women could be, you know, molested if they don't wear proper clothes. This was Arab society in 7th century. There is a story in Medina that a Muslim woman was buying, was doing shopping in the market in the green grocery, Sabzimi Kharid. And she was doing that grocery uh, buying, and a Jew or an Arab, somebody, you know, tied her clothes to something, a wood or something, and when she got up, her clothes were raised. There was the time, they're telling us, the Mufassirin are telling us that that's the time when hijab was when Jalabiya was, you know, introduced that you better wear something far more protective because otherwise you will be victims of men. So that's, now, again, showing will hair in some cultures means nothing. Showing your bodily part in some cultures means everything. In other words, it's very relative, it's cultural. Hijab is a cultural issue. What what works in American society, there should be hijab the way men and women, you know, see one or each other with respect. So it might not be proper to cover your face, like some, you know, students are doing in, in George Mason University. There are Saudi students who cover their face. I don't know what purpose it serves. It draws even more attention. So you are trying to avoid to draw attention, but what is the rule in Quran is that please, be modest and careful because you could be molested, you could be a victim of a man, and it is more dangerous for a woman to be a make victim than for a man to be a victim. I don't mean to say men are not raped. Boys are raped. 
There, is, there are so many stories, horror stories. And you know, when you read about Pakistan, for example, in the madrasa, the boys are raped by the teachers. I have read so many reports, I don't know how authentic, God knows. In other words, we are talking about a situation in which man is not safe, a woman is not safe. How do you find a way of protecting yourself? That's what the answer is, that hijab, according to the Quran, is a kind of protection for a woman to say, don't come closer to me. I'm careful about myself. But when you leave yourself open, then you are, you know, the articles that I'm reading these days, the women also should take, to, should take some blame for what is happening to them. I'm reading recently, by the way, there are so many articles. Because they wear clothes in such a way and they attract men and this is going to happen. In other words, neither man nor a woman is safe in the society if you don't know how to protect yourself. We need to teach our girls, our daughters, our sons to be aware of the dangers awaiting them. I just want to make a clarification there, because what about in Iran, where everybody's covered and they still get raped and molested and everything? Are the women, do the women have to be held accountable as well? well your question once again very clearly. Give me your quick, clear question. Yeah. So what in, if? So in Iran, women are covered fully and they still get raped and molested. Should they be also held accountable? <laughs> I have seen, um, I should not speak about Iran or Iraq or anywhere, but I have seen problems in the way women can expose themselves to the dangerous situation in which they find themselves. Not all women are properly covered in Iran, by the way. There are some who are not covered properly. You go to northern part of uh, Tehran, for example, women don't cover themselves anymore. They have, you know, hair outside, and they show quite clearly by wearing tight clothes that they are not following the moral modesty requirements, and therefore they become the victims. I, I'm, I'm, I'm not justifying, but I'm simply saying that sometimes we expose ourselves to the dangers in the society. Sometimes men are misbehaving, and they would do it anyways, whether you wear or you don't wear. During the Shah's time, when I was a student, when I was a student, my friends used to take me with them and tell me, let's go here in this place. And I said, what's this place? And there were women who were fully in Chador, by the way, but there were prostitutes. In those days, Shah's days, in other words, they used to cover themselves. Now, of course, I separated myself, whatever I did, but the dangers were there even at that time, the dangers are there even at this time. Woman is not safe in any part of the world. Please, let's be honest about it. Women are not safe. And it's a woman who becomes pregnant. It's a woman whose honor is hurt when these things happen. Therefore, the Quranic philosophy is that if, you know, if man is not going to change, what are you going to do? Are you going to you know, expose yourself to the victimhood, what are you going to do? In other words, we have a choice. Either we follow or we don't follow. I don't think anybody can force anybody to be religious. I don't think so. So, Brother Abdulaziz. Yes. If it is possible, the food is waiting for you and me. Allahumma salli ala There's no more questions. ala khair al ta'am. I have one question, final question. I don't, um, just to follow up on what the sister was asking. So my understanding is this guidance that we have, this in the Quran, for the man to you know, avert look his down. look down and the additional guidance for the women who you mentioned the khimar, right? My understanding, it might be wrong, but is that at that time uh, the women in Arabia used to wear khimar over their head, behind their ears. It was pulled behind their ears, leaving their front exposed, their chest exposed, there was, uh, you know, 
short cut uh, dresses, their upper, you know, their clothing was, I guess you call it low cut. So they already, my understanding is that they already wore hijab on their head, quote unquote, you know, what we call hijab. I, I, hijab is not even the right word, khimar. This is a scarf on their head covering their hair and their ears. So if that's already the norm, if that's already understood that that's what they're wearing, then maybe it doesn't need to be explicit to wear the khimar over top of your head when the commandment is to cover, use your khimar to cover your bosoms. So the idea is not that you're going to take the khimar off your head and cover your bosoms or your chest. Uh, the idea is you use the cloth that's already on your head to also cover your bosoms. So that, that was my understanding, which might be wrong. But. No, your understanding needs to take into consideration the full ayat of the Quran. The full ayat of the Quran says, don't adopt the ways of jahiliya. So, so the sign is very clear. Don't become like women in the jahiliya. Adopt this so that you are protected, you are, you are respected for what you are. In other words, there is a critique in the Quran of the pre-Islamic days. You know, ayyam al-jahiliya, hamiyat al-jahiliya. And I think the Quran is quite clear that if you want to do the khimar that you knew before Islam came, that's not what we are saying. We are telling you this. This is what you need to do for yourself. In other words, there is a reform taking place. If there was only, you know, a kind of reinforcing what was already in the society prevalent, then it would not have been a reform. What we are talking about is a reform whereby a woman's dignity is not taken for granted. Woman is not insulted. The woman is not suffering because of the man's animal instincts. This is what it is. And the Quran is quite clear that the man will not behave, but you need to protect yourself from men because their hearts are diseased and their hearts are sick. And I, I think that we are seeing in all these cases in the last year that we have Me Too, hashtag for example, we've been reading about this men who are hungry and even the big scholar, you know, Tariq Ramadan, you couldn't even believe that this man, you know, he was there today in the television, you know, trying to defend himself for having raped the woman, you know, in Paris. No, there is no defense. Come on, wait a minute. You can't do that. You can't take that position. If you are a Muslim scholar, if you claim to be the grandson of Hassan al-Banna, the founder of Muslim Brotherhood, you can't do that. In other words, really there is the hypocrisy and duplicity in the world today. And what I'm worried about is that I hope that we are smart enough to know where to draw a line. If we don't know how to draw a line, then we'll be in trouble. One day or another, people will abuse us. It happens in all fields, by the way. All fields. Thank one, you so much. Sorry, Thank I, you. one last One last question. Yeah, yeah, sorry. On this the, is $50. Uh, <laughs> yeah. It's worth it. It's worth no. it for me. Um, so as far as the Quran is concerned, so again, I have to study better, but uh, not reading ayahs out of context. I think the last time I read some ayah related to Khimar or Jilbab, the next ayah or the second half of the ayah talked about the consequences for the man if, you're, if the women are still molested, if they wear this, if they comply with all these things, guard their eyes, this, 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 and if they're still molested, there's a consequence for those men. And sure, sure. I'm, and I'm, I must tell you that in my own understanding of the Quran, how much little I have read, I understand that the Quranic philosophy is to take care of a woman in family, in society, in the world as a whole. That's the goal. It is moving from family, from being a mother, being a sister, being a daughter, being so and so, the roles, the honor. And when you took, keep all these verses together, what you really uncover is a goal that is leading towards an ideal society where a woman is safe and a man is safe. کتاب الله و اترتی اهل بیتی کتاب الله ان زهرا کتاب الله ان بکاتی الله هم صلی الله و محمد و آل محمد
at two o'clock, we have the 22nd of Bahman's issues. So for those of you that you are alone, convey the message and we send you the email anyway. So Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Wal asri inna al-insana la fi khus illa al-ladhina amanu wa amanu al-salahat wa ta'asub al-haqq wa ta'asub al-salahat. صدق الله العلي العظيم اللهم صل على محمد وعلى محمد